June 4th, 1942, 10.20 a.m. Bombers from USS Enterprise find their target in the middle of the Pacific. They are Japanese carriers Kaga and Akagi, part of an enormous Japanese fleet. Japanese Zero fighters have been distracted with earlier assaults. They tear apart the slower planes, but leave their home carriers unprotected. Perfect prey for the hunting dive bombers of Enterprise. 26-year-old Dusty Cleese spots his target, carrier Kaga. Everything was ideal. We were up to about like 20,000 feet, and they were coming towards us. Cleese begins his dive, but all 32 bombers in the squadron plunge at exactly the same time, nearly causing mid-air collisions. To make matters worse, some dive too steeply. Our plane is jerking around, and I don't know what's going on or why. My pilot has the throttle at the firewall just as hard as he can go. It is payback for Pearl Harbor, and it may be doomed before a single bomb is dropped. The overeager flyboys of Enterprise are looking for vengeance. They are diving into a trap. Flashback. The battle called Midway had actually begun 24 hours before. On June 3rd, 1942, USS Enterprise sails 900 miles from her home base in Hawaii, accompanied by fellow carriers Yorktown and Hornet. She is heading for a tiny American outpost on a remote atoll called Midway. 175 miles west, four Japanese carriers steam southeastward on a collision course. Imperial Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto plans to finish the job he started at Pearl Harbor. The USS Enterprise is what the Japanese really wanted to take out. Yamamoto knew that if he could take out our carriers, they essentially would win the war. The main force of Japanese ships headed toward Midway include four aircraft carriers. Kaga, Akagi, Soryu, and Hiryu. Seven battleships, 150 support ships, cruisers, destroyers, and tankers, 248 carrier aircraft, 16 float planes, and some 15 submarines. The American Armada is substantially smaller. Three aircraft carriers, 50 support ships, 233 carrier aircraft, 127 land-based aircraft on Midway Island, and eight submarines, outnumbered nearly two to one. Six months after Pearl Harbor, this is all that is left of America's Navy. The carriers were not present at the sneak attack, to Yamamoto's dismay. He said, we have no idea what we've done. He was definitely disappointed and worried. One carrier, Lexington, has already been sunk a month ago. And now, Admiral Yamamoto plans to lure the rest of them into a trap. He'll target Midway Island. Midway is close enough to Hawaii that it will be seen as a threat to the security of Oahu and Pearl Harbor, and yet it's far enough away that American air power in the Hawaiian Islands can't really make its presence felt during the forthcoming battle. The Japanese Code. The U.S. Navy has worked round the clock to crack the Imperial Navy's code. AF is Midway Island. Admiral Nimitz has evened up the odds. The Japanese Navy is arriving in full force. But the Americans will be waiting. For the US, it is a true 360 degree battle. Target, Midway Island. Objective, protect the American base and inflict as much damage as possible on the superior Japanese fleet. Strategy, ambush with air, sea, and sub attacks. Nimitz knows that the Japanese will approach Midway from the Northwest. So he sends his aircraft carriers, Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown, to a staging point 200 miles northeast of the island. 
When the Japanese carriers come within range, American bombers will attack. And all signs point to the 4th of June as the day the enemy ships will reach the battle zone. Dawn, June 4th, 1942. It's clear and quiet as USS Enterprise floats near the exact center of the Pacific. Scout planes search for the enemy carriers, but they are too late. Japanese bombers, Cates and Vals, get the first hit at Midway. A force of 109 Japanese aircraft appear over the atoll. They tear into the American base, exploding hangars and cratering runways. It is like Pearl Harbor all over again. Back with Enterprise and her task force. Sailors prepare for action, but haven't gotten word of the midway attacks. While the torpedo planes lumber into the sky, American forces have already begun the assault on the Japanese. 7.10 a.m., the first wave of the American attack begins. Bombers have launched from Midway Island to attack the Japanese carriers. The enemy warships open up with anti-aircraft fire. A typical Japanese aircraft carrier is bristling with weaponry. The Kaga, an important carrier in this fight, wields five eight-inch guns that can reach out more than 10 miles. For medium-range work, it has 16 120-millimeter batteries. And for the close-in flight, 22 25-millimeter cannons. This anti-aircraft arsenal can unleash a murderous hailstorm of lead. 160 miles west, the Japanese continue to Midway. But at mid-morning, Japanese scout planes report the presence of the American aircraft carriers. The Japanese fleet immediately breaks from its southeasterly course and heads northeast toward the American warships. In changing course, the Japanese carriers soon steam right into the path of two American torpedo bomber squadrons. The torpedo bombers of USS Hornet spot the enemy carriers first. All 15 TBD devastators roll in for the attack. Most of the lumbering airplanes do not even get close. Swarming Zero fighters and flak from enemy destroyers and battleships send them crashing into the briny water below. A single than 20 minutes when the torpedo bombers of USS Enterprise reach the battle area. As they drop close to the water to begin their attack, they too slam into ferocious anti-aircraft fire and attacks from Zero fighters. Most go down, but four Enterprise torpedo bombers manage to escape the deadly barrage and will eventually make it back to the ship. But at this point in the battle, Dusty Cleese has more things to worry about. Dusty is part of a dive bomber group well behind the torpedo planes. Heading up Dusty's air group is Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey, but he normally flies a fighter, not a bomber and he's leading this group like a bat out of hell. He was a fighter pilot. His whole idea was, you know, it's the one that hits first is the one that's going to win. So we were going at 190 knots. Dauntless dive bombers usually fly at 160 knots. At 190 knots, they may run out of fuel before they can return. McCluskey changes course and tails the Arashi. If the Enterprise flyers can keep from running out of gas, they may hit pay dirt. The Yorktown torpedo bombers score no hits. Most are shot down before they ever get close enough to drop their torpedoes. The score, the Japanese have shot down 25 planes. Americans, none. But the Yorktown's disastrous attack inadvertently brings a lucky turn of events for the Americans. 
the Japanese fighters were focusing on an incoming torpedo plane attack from VT-3, Yorktown's torpedo squadron, and were forgetting to look around them to see if there were additional attacks coming in. The Zeros have temporarily left the Japanese carriers without air cover. And at just that point, Wade McCluskey and his Enterprise dive bombers appear on the horizon, like the cavalry riding to the attack. McCluskey has followed the Japanese destroyer Arashi directly to the big prize, the Japanese carrier fleet. This is the moment bomber pilot Dusty Cleese recognizes his target, the Kaga. I could see these two great big ships, you know, that were closest to us, and then a, a smaller one that was farthest away. The two ones closest had to be the Kagi and the Kaga. Lieutenant Commander McCluskey immediately orders an attack, giving instructions for the air group to split in two, with one squadron attacking the Kaga and the other attacking the Akagi. And they were headed directly into the wind. Boy, that's the perfect place to, to make an aiming spot on ships. Heading into the wind helps a bomber and bomb stay on course. A crosswind can alter the trajectory of both. The air group begins its dive, but there's confusion initially. Everyone goes for the same ship at first, the Kaga. We almost had some mid-air collisions because uh, we were, had two squadrons that were both starting to try to dive on the same aircraft carrier. Fortunately, one of the squadron commanders, Dick Best, alertly recognizes the error and breaks off with two other planes to attack the Akagi. At the same time, back with the main bomber group diving on the Kaga, confusion has caused the pilot of Donald Hoff's plane, James Dexter, to dive his bomber at a much steeper angle than he'd intended. When his ammunition belts begin to fall out of the plane, Hoff's pilot drops his bombs and pulls up steeply, bringing the ammo belts back into the plane. Unfortunately, the pilot's bomb has missed. Altitude to a drop point, and in that period of time, it'd be three or four planes in the same dive. And so you could see the dives ahead, and you could see the bombs where they were falling. And normally, you drop at 1,500 feet. I think everybody went right down to 1,500 feet. And when you pull out, you're just glued to the seat. You can't move until he straightens out enough. I watched McCluskey and his two wingmen drop their bomb. They missed. And then Earl Gallagher was the next one. It hit directly about like 200 feet from the stern of, of the Kaga. Now here was the first fighter plane taken off. Now this 500 pounder landed smack right on top of it and it exploded. Next, it is Dusty Cleese's turn, and he's willing to risk his life to hit the target. I aim at the big red circle at the front. Now, of course, you don't aim where it is, you aim where it's going to be. I wanted to make sure I was going to hit, so I only pulled out uh, that thing, you know, at a thousand feet. 9G pull out to, to just barely miss hitting the ocean. It hit this, the rear rim of that big red circle. This thing went way, way down below deck. James Dexter and Don Ha also pull out very close to the water. I was looking right at the side of the ship, and of course there were other planes that had hit with bombs and with explosions, and there was smoke and fire. And about that time, he made a real sharp turn to his left. Dexter has pulled the sharp left to avoid a Japanese cruiser up ahead. But they're trying to make it a very difficult target for that cruiser to hit them. But Dexter and Hoff soon confront a new threat. So 
suddenly in front of us are these big columns of water that are exploding coming up in front of us. And uh... the other pilots also make it clear without serious mishap. USS Enterprise is still 150 miles ahead of them. Now the question was, do we have enough gas to get back to the ship? The victors have hit hard, but they may not survive the return. And there's one more Japanese carrier still out there, preparing for an attack. June 4th, 1942, the Battle of Midway. Enterprise's first attack on the Japanese fleet is breathtaking. The outnumbered flyers of Enterprise have wreaked havoc on the Imperial aircraft carriers. Kaga has been hit by the better part of two dive bomber squadrons from Enterprise, and she is utterly demolished. She is left burning from stem to stern almost instantaneously with a very heavy loss of life. Akagi takes longer to brew up, but is eventually consumed by the same sort of uh, catastrophic fires that uh, are also consuming her sister, Kaga. And while Enterprise's bombers are tearing up these two, a third carrier, Soryu, some five miles northeast, has also fallen victim to the strike. Dive bombers from USS Yorktown have ravaged her. They end up singling out the carrier Soryu and hitting her three times with 1,000 pound bombs and turn her into a, a floating wreck as well. 20 miles away, Dusty Cleese feels it's now safe to take a look back at the results of his squadron's attack. He could look back and he could see the three big balls of fire, and it was, there was the three Japanese ships that were on fire. And as he was looking back, all of a sudden, one of those ships actually exploded. It must have hit the munitions that was aboard the ship. The huge mushroom cloud came up and over the top. The surviving dive bomber crews are ecstatic with their success. But they're still in harm's way. They must make it free of the kill zone. The air is filled with angry Zeros that have just lost their home carrier. They're desperate and they're dangerous. Bomber pilot Hopkins checks to see whether his backseat partner is still okay. Ed Anderson gives the thumbs up. The SBD rear seat gunners have their work cut out for them, and this leads to some remarkable personal actions. Rear seat gunner was firing his machine gun and it broke loose from its mouth. But no extraordinary physical effort can save rear seat gunner Bruno Guido and his pilot Frank O'Flaherty. This air crew will pay a high price for the morning's accomplishments. As the buzzing Japanese Zeros counterattack ferociously, bullets from the guns of the Zeros perforate the fuel tanks on O'Flaherty and Guido's plane. Fuel leakage eventually causes the duo to ditch in the ocean. They survive the crash, but they're discovered by the Japanese and fish from the water by an enemy warship. The Japanese crew isn't happy about the loss of three of the Imperial Navy's aircraft carriers. Now there's only one Japanese carrier left, the Hiryu. Hiryu remains untouched by the morning's attack from Yorktown torpedo bombers, and now she wants revenge. Now, a Japanese scout plane has just informed Hiryu of the whereabouts of USS Enterprise and her sister warships. Just before 11 a.m., Hiryu launches its bombers, a retaliatory strike. Two squadrons of Val dive bombers, each carrying 550 pounds of explosives, head for their targets. Navigation is simple for them. They simply trail some of the returning American bombers back to the U.S. carrier group. It's quiet at midday near Enterprise and her task force. Then a faint humming sound develops in the far distance. It grows louder, gradually becoming an ominous roar. Three miles and 180 degrees to the rear. 
the attack planes close in. The first line of defense are the destroyer anti-aircraft guns. If the enemy bombers make it through that, they become targets for the Enterprise Wildcats, circling the sky to shoot down bombers before they can drop their payloads. Aboard USS Enterprise, ship's bugler James Barnhill watches Enterprise fighter aircraft rush to intercept the enemy attackers. What I could see was Japanese planes coming in after us and our guns and planes going out like a shield and keeping them away from the Enterprise. The first American carrier that lands in the Hear You bomber sites is USS Yorktown. Some of the enemy planes make it through the ship's defenses. And three bombs make direct hits on Yorktown's flight deck. One bomb kills 17 gunners and tears a 10-foot square hole in the center of the flight deck. Another bomb drilled its way through to the base of the smokestack before exploding and extinguishing the boilers. Multiple fires erupt. American carrier flight decks in World War II have a top layer of wooden planks. It is a way to lighten the weight of the overall ship. But the wooden surface compounds the danger when fires erupt. But the Yorktown damage control crew leaps into action unreeling hoses and dousing burning surfaces with extinguishing foam. And they patched the hole in the deck. They got the waters working again. A couple of hours later, the fire is completely extinguished. The hole in the deck is patched, and Yorktown is back underway at 19 knots. But her new lease on life is cut short. At mid-afternoon, a second wave of bombers arrives from the Hiryu. These carry torpedoes. Again, they reach Yorktown first. But since the vessel is no longer burning and has been patched so quickly, they believe it is a different carrier. Five bombers make it through intense anti-aircraft fire and drop their torpedoes. Two of the torpedoes score direct hits on Yorktown's port side. Again, the fires are extinguished, but this time, the damage is too severe to be repaired quickly. The listing deck is a serious problem for Yorktown's flyers. One air crew that must bypass Yorktown is wounded rear seat gunner Lloyd Childers and his pilot Harry Coral. We came back to the Yorktown and looking at it, noticed immediately there was about a 30 degree list and uh, she was dead in the water. The angle means the Yorktown's aircraft have no place to land. There's only one hope for the stranded flyers of Yorktown, the deck of Enterprise. Now the Big E does double duty, home base for both her planes and those of Yorktown. But Childers' torpedo bomber is badly damaged. They are forced to ditch in the ocean within sight of the carriers. But there's one more enemy carrier out there and attacks from her bombers must be put to a stop. Enterprise launches her squadrons for a final run. Their goal, the carrier hear you, the enemy vessel that has mortally wounded Yorktown, and some of the pilots carry a grudge. Good afternoon. After more than an hour in the air, the dive bombers from Enterprise and Yorktown come in range of hear you. Pilot Earl Gallagher is leading this attack. He plunges toward the carrier. Just as he dropped his bomb, the hear you made a tight turn, you know, like this thing. And so he, his bomb landed exactly right where it should be, you know, if the, if the ship hadn't made that tight turn. So I had made these corrections to, to hit the bow. When Cleese dives, he doesn't make the same mistake. It's a direct hit. It just took that front end of the hear you and it like a taco, it just rolled it back on, on top of itself, and of course it made that ship totally useless. The 
bow of Hiryu is torn apart. Fire spreads below decks. The Japanese Navy chooses to sink her. Admiral Yamamoto's plan to trap the American carriers has backfired spectacularly. In a single battle, four Japanese carriers are sunk. One cruiser is scuttled, 228 Japanese aircraft destroyed, and 3,000 Japanese sailors and crewmen are killed. Although the American losses include one destroyer and the carrier Yorktown, it is the most surprising victory in the annals of U.S. naval warfare. Yamamoto is forced to call off the attempted invasion of Midway. <laughs> 